Hello everyone, this is Ben. In today's video, we're going to revisit the moral argument for God's existence. The reason why we're doing that is because I think I may have stumbled across a, a little bit better way to put it, and uh, I might make this a, a, a better made video in the future, but I just want to go ahead and make this and kind of get the thoughts together. So, what I normally do with the moral argument for God's existence is lay out the premises of the argument or the, the premises and the conclusion, which would be the syllogism. And I, I modify uh, the premise from the way maybe William Lane Craig would put it because uh, he says, you know, moral values and duties. I would just say right and wrong. Um, and also, if I say good and evil, so like I could start the first premise and say good and evil exist if and only if God exists. I've had teenagers especially, they think of good and evil as people actually doing good and evil things. But I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about the concept of good and evil. The fact that there is such a thing. So like, um, I say right and wrong because that tends to to you know bypass that problem but a lot of confusions emerge with the moral argument for God's existence um uh I you know it seems like I, if I had a dime for every time I say that the argument is logically valid and then the next sentence is what that means is that if you know the the, the two premises are true then the conclusion must be true so now we have to ask whether or not the premises are true. And it's so common to have someone scroll down and immediately comment that the uh, that would mean, you know, that they don't understand how I'm using the word valid. They think valid just is another way of saying correct or uh, reasonable, or rational, or proven true. But validity in terms of a, an argument in philosophy and logic would just be that, you know, the, the conclusion must be true if the premises are true. So that's what a valid argument is. It's just a way of outlining, you know, what you're doing. But the problem you run into is that uh, if you don't give the benefit to giving the syllogism and you say right and wrong exists if and only if God exists, right and wrong exists, therefore God exists, the benefit is that that creates a very good uh, framework so that people will begin to see like okay we we not it's like a checklist and so it doesn't allow you know it gives it gives guidance and it keeps the keeps the concepts from just wandering all over the place and we understand what we're here to do you know so uh there's another way of putting it where you could say if there is no moral law there is no moral lawgiver there is a moral law Therefore, there's a moral lawgiver. So that's that's like uh, that's Robbie Zacharias's terminology. Is uh, he said he uses the term moral lawgiver. Um, now he uses the term. I think he tends to say there's an absolute moral law. Now the benefit to the well, I always struggled with that. And in fact, whenever I once upon a time, whenever I heard Ravi make that argument, I always thought it was a bad argument because I did not see why if there's a moral law there has to be a moral law giver I just did not understand like why that has to be sure it can be but it just seemed like the the laws could exist the moral laws could just exist without a moral law giver and uh, I came to understand the is-ought distinction, that there's a fundamental difference between a statement about how things are and a statement about how things ought to be. But it's one of those things that, part of the reason I make these videos a lot of time is because I don't like the way the 
Christian apologists always explain this stuff. They always leave giant loopholes or the concept is not really communicated. And it was a long time of hearing the moral argument for God's existence from Ravi and from William Lane Craig for years and years. And then I stumbled across a very random little video on YouTube that talked about the is ought distinction and just like, you know, explained that like why the, if there's a moral law, there has to be a moral lawgiver. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, that actually, I, I get that now. And like I was persuaded by the argument. Um, and I try very hard to keep from giving people ways out of what I'm saying. And, you know, as I understand it, the bread and butter of philosophy is to really make an undeniable argument. That's what your goal is. And I see a lot of the uh, proofs for God, you know, whether it's the moral argument or something else, they're giving all sorts of, like, ways out. Um, it might be that the target audience is not me or people who think like me, and so the ways out aren't really ways out, but but I do, but I think are like me, and I think there's other people who think like me, and so uh, those people, you know, maybe I'm just called to talk to those people who think like me, you know, so like maybe, you know, maybe these guys that I'm listening to, are, they, they just talk to professors, and they just assume certain things, professors just know certain things, or or they just understand professors won't ever think of that that thing, you know. Um, so, with the moral argument for God's existence, I think really it could be summed up as follows. You start out by just making the case that there is a moral law. Because what I've found is that teenagers and young people tend to believe that morality is completely subjective. And uh, the reason they think that is because of a false dilemma in the way that they think. And I've, I've got some experience with this with you know different sets of teenagers from different parts of the state of Georgia where I live, and they tend to always say the same thing. I've read articles online that say that surveys indicate that young people tend to, they don't believe that there are moral facts, only moral opinions. So that an idea about good and evil is just one person's opinion, and it's no, it's no more, haha, valid, ha. Huh? It's no more true or factual than someone else's. So, uh, that's the first thing you gotta deal with. So, the, the first thing I would just say is establish that there's a moral law, that there's such a thing as good and evil, most people will agree with you that there's such thing as good and evil, and you can just give them an example like, do you think it's okay, do you think it's morally superior to like love your neighbor or eat your neighbor? You know, you can give them some extreme example, and most of the time they're going to just see that like, you know, oh yeah, there's a, you know, there's such a thing as good and evil. Most people believe in that. But you do, it's more common with teenagers to not believe in that. And it's across the board, male and female, they both just don't believe in it. And it took me a while to figure out where they're coming from. They, they have a false dilemma in the way that they're thinking. And so that's an indication of it being an actual intellectual fallacy. Like this is, they don't get it. It's not like, it's not like special pleading or something where a person just has an agenda. But this is a false dilemma. So a false dilemma would be like if I asked you, are you a fascist or a communist? And then stuck the microphone in your face. And so, or I said, you know, an extreme example would be like, click like and share if you love Jesus. Keep scrolling if you're going to hell with Satan. You know, um, so what people do is uh, they give you two choices and there's actually more than two choices. Um, so they're giving you a dilemma where you don't like either of the choices, but they made one choice worse than the other one so that you'll, you'll take the other one. When in reality, there's, there's more than two choices. So the false dilemma here is that they essentially, they're saying we know everything about good and evil and morality, or we know nothing about good and evil and morality. We either know everything or we know nothing. 
And as soon as I lay that out, it, it immediately becomes clear what I'm saying. It's like, oh yeah, that's ridiculous. We could know something without knowing everything. Okay. And so for us to know that there is an objective, you know, there is a moral law, all we have to do is know something. We don't have to know everything to know that there's a something to know. So in other words, our concept of morality can be progressive. It can be improving. But that was, that's really the, the primary way that people don't get it. Um, and, and the, the interesting thing is, uh, I even had, I had one teenage girl, a 15 year old girl, say, say it to me like that recently. And I was like, oh, that's what they're thinking. And I kind of been thinking along those lines, but what she said was, you know, morality is subjective because mankind's concept of perfection is always changing. And I was like, oh, I think I see what she's saying. She's saying, yeah, we either know nothing or we know everything. So it's a false dilemma. So in other words, all I do is introduce a third option and it immediately, most people will, re will immediately recognize that that third option is correct. I didn't technically prove that the third option is the correct option. Rather, I just, what I did prove is that it's possible because really all their, the way they're thinking, they're just not considering it. Um, so as soon as you just introduce it, it immediately resolves the dilemma. So, uh, for example, the Sadducees, you know, they, they argue with Jesus about the woman who, who, you know, they, they were going to debunk the resurrection and, uh, say that, you know, if a woman marries seven men, like, whose husband will she be in the afterlife? And then Jesus just introduced, you know, that it, it's not like that. You know, marriage is, doesn't work like that in heaven. So, uh, debunking a false dilemma is typically more of a defensive exercise because they're trying to prove a point and you're just demonstrating that they didn't prove it. It won't actually prove your point, but that you can get to that later. Most people are ready to accept and recognize that like some things are evil, but there is a tendency toward with everyone to simply think that the skeptical view is the wise view. And so they don't see knowledge as ever wise. That's just common today. Any, anytime you can doubt something, you're the, you're the, you're the smarty pants. So you're smart for not knowing things today. Um, that, that's, gen that's just a general trend you have to deal with. Okay, so, uh, and some people, you know, think about apologetics and doing it and they just get really, uh, they think it's a waste of time. But I did hear something interesting today. The fact of the matter is a lot of people, for a lot of people, apologetics is a major way that they come to faith in God. And so, there's a tendency, you know, if you're anti-apologetics, there's a tendency from these these Christians who think it's like a waste of time. It's very similar. First of all, they just completely ignore. Uh, they they're just completely ignorant of all the people who for whom it actually made the difference. Second of all, they probably think that like evangelism without apologetics is super effective. But according to the Bible, most people are not going to make it to heaven. So the 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 preaching of the the fundamental story of the gospel isn't that effective either, according to according to Jesus. Um according to what he says in the book of Luke about you know the wide and the broad gates. But see the thing is like and when you say it's a waste of time, it's like, well, people are coming to faith through that. And so that's like, it's very similar to telling me that like, if I want to go be a missionary to Japan and like, I'm, I feel called to the Japanese and I go, and then you tell me that that's a waste of time and that I shouldn't be doing that. I mean, I have people like tell me that like, I should be preaching the gospel 
and they they set up a false dilemma because all apologetics really would be defending and proving the gospel and so you can't really not share the gospel without but also do apologetics those two you know if you're proving the existence of God well the existence of God is the first component of the gospel you know and if you prove the moral argument then also it it lends weight to mankind's depravity because God would become the ultimate standard so you're talking about the gospel already but uh essentially it's really kind of rude and hurtful people people do say that I mean, I've had people like that thick in their thinking and that thick-headed that they just won't accept it and I hate to say it but sometimes it does seem like they just want to justify intellectual laziness and but the thing is like maybe you're not caught you don't have that calling to that group of people you know, just just because somebody wants to go to Japan and and share about Jesus, don't you shouldn't say that like they're a sinner for doing that or it's wrong. And uh, because they that's where they're called to go, and they will have a ministry there. And so, if you're called to go to the type of person who for whom apologetics would be effective, then that's your calling. But like. Uh, and the, and the other point, and this, I'm, I'm borrowing this from William Lane Craig, but like the other point is like the people who are converted through apologetics tend to be very effective. Like people like C.S. Lewis and Ravi Zacharias and uh, William Lane Craig was an atheist, but he wasn't converted through apologetics. Um, so there's an example for you there. But Ravi Zacharias, it was very important for him. Uh, C.S. Lewis it was very much converted by apologetics, and uh, so was G.K. Chesterton. Although G.K. Chesterton uh, was like, he was actually an atheist and read atheist apologetics, and he saw how stupid all of it. He, he just came to be, to realize that atheism fails to prove itself true. Um, but anyway, these people tend to be really effective uh, for the Lord people who are converted through apologetics um, or for whom it became important especially people who like were formerly you know atheists or something opposed to Christianity when they get converted now back to the point we can lay out the moral argument I think a simple framework would just be make a case for morality you know and you just deal with that false dilemma. Most people are already going to agree with you that morality exists, but just deal with that false dilemma. You know, um, the simplest thing you do is you start out by just giving an example of something like slavery. And so you could start with slavery. Most people today are right off the bat going to say slavery is evil and it doesn't matter who, you know, what your society thinks. It's evil. Okay, and then slavery is a great example because people's perceptions on slavery has changed greatly so today we think it's evil but in the ancient Roman Empire uh, they had 80 to 90 percent slaves and they thought it was proof of their glory like it made them glorious and it was a reason you know they were proud of it so perceptions on slavery have greatly altered so you bring up the issue of subjective morals and that kind of thing and then you move to, okay, the false dilemma. There's a false dilemma that says we either know everything or we know nothing. And, and of course, we don't know everything. And so the way, they, you know, the way they prove that we don't know everything is they bring up some example of some difficult-to-understand moral question. Okay, and so there you have it. Now, once you've established that there is a moral law, Probably at this point you can move forward. There are ways around it, but most people are going to just say, okay, yeah, you've dealt with my one objection. Um, but all you're really doing, you're not starting out with saying that, you know, there's a God. You're just starting out with saying that there's such a thing as right and wrong. So then you just say that if there is morality, and hopefully they've gotten the point by now that there is of the, of the absolute moral law, then you just move from there to say that there's a moral lawgiver. There must be some being 
that is the source of the moral law. And it's an absolute moral law that's, that's it's objective, I guess would be a better way of putting it, because it's, it's absolute and objective. And objective, objective is a good objective to, to be wanting to prove, because the, the objectivity of it just means that it's true regardless of what anyone thinks. So, like, objective would mean that, like, if you have seven dollars in your wallet, like I have seven dollars in my wallet right now, it's an objective fact that I have seven dollars in my wallet. But if I say that chocolate chip cookies taste better and you say that sugar cookies taste better, that's subjective. There's no way to really prove, you know, that it's a fact that I'm right and that you're wrong. But so you want you want to make it clear that, you know, it doesn't, and, and and by dealing, you know, with the issue of, of of subjective morality and and the false dilemma stuff, like you're making that point. So all you have to do now is just demonstrate that there's a moral lawgiver. And I realized probably the easiest way I could explain this premise that if there's a moral law, there must be a moral lawgiver. I figured this out. I was like, I think you could sum it up with one word desire desire is a very simple word but I think you could sum all of this up with that one word just desire so like in other words morals are desires and you sit back and you say it doesn't take a lot of thought to recognize that like yeah they that's exactly what they are or I can make it even more obvious and say morals are desires about the way the world should be, about the way about the way the world should be. And if you connect that with that there's objectively true desires that are absolute regardless of what anyone thinks about the way the world should be, well then there has to be a moral lawgiver that's the foundation of good of, of morality, of goodness that's the moral lawgiver that gives them and so you immediately that that kind of like is gain you know in other words if someone wants to say that there's like there's a moral law without a moral lawgiver it's like saying there's desires without anyone that's doing the desiring it's like yeah this this moral law exists it's like a piece of paper with just with laws on it and it has desires but it's not a personal being Okay, it's just ridiculous. Like, I think people, like, pick up on that quickly. And so, you could move through it like that, I think, and just start with, like, something like slavery, debunk the false dilemma, and then just say, you know, morals are desires about the way the world ought to be. And you could go through the moral argument kind of fast. You just start with slavery's evil, and it doesn't matter who you are. Everyone knows slavery's evil. It's evil. And, you know, and then you talk about how people's concept of what's right and wrong has changed. And some people say, you know, well, that means that there's, that it's all just man-made. It's just a made-up man-made idea. And morality is just a man-made idea. But, you know, just because we don't know everything about morality, it doesn't mean we know nothing about morality. Maybe we know something, you know. And debunking the false dilemma, the false dilemma gives the strength of that subjective position for people. And once they get that, by that point, they're already thinking like, okay, I get the concept of absolute moral laws. And then you just say morals are desires about the way the world ought to be. So like there's an absolute moral lawgiver that's the foundation of goodness and morality. And it's like, okay, yo, yeah. like that, you know, so I went through it in like a minute, you know, like you could go through it kind of fast. Um, And so then the only... The only way around that, you know, the morals are desires is really airtight. So the only way around that, you know, is to go back to the existence of objective morality because all I did was say that, oh, you know, some people, uh, you know, uh, all I did was just debunk the false dilemma, but I didn't actually prove it. I just said that, you know, your false dilemma to debunk it fails. But the only way you can disprove morality is to say that there are no moral facts. 
and all of our beliefs about morality are are wrong so you could say that like you know slavery is not actually any not actually immoral and you know charity for poor people is not actually morally superior to enslaving them so uh here's the thing there's only two if if morality is a lie if it's not true then there's only two ways it can be untrue it can be something that we make up ourselves or it could be some kind of trick that's put on us from the outside you know so it can be a delusion or an illusion that's it Subjective morality is the idea that it's a delusion, that we just make it up and we're just pretending that some things are good and evil. And maybe, maybe you were taught it because human society overall just made it up. Now, there's actually a fundamental logical flaw with that, but this does require a little more thinking. So I'm not sure if I have a real good way to spell it out for people, but essentially to cut right through it, what you're saying with subjective morality is that people made up the idea that something is better than something else without thinking that anything is better than anything else. They made up the idea of liking something without actually wanting to do it. You know, I, maybe I could come up with a better way of saying it, but essentially that's, that's, that's fundamentally, that's the problem there. You're saying people, you know, so in other words, like, Probably a good way to explain this is to say that, you know, people can delude themselves, but they always delude themselves to get something that they already wanted. But what we're talking about is deluding yourself into wanting anything at all when you, when you previously wanted nothing. That's ridiculous. You know, so people delude themselves all the time. Like I know a guy, he used to work with me and he, he moved to North Carolina, but, and he, and, uh, in his church, it's a little small uh, church, a little small. I think he said Methodist church. I don't remember what kind of church, but there's a there's a there's a crazy woman at this church, and this crazy woman. Uh, it's a small church, so it, it, in small churches you do prayer requests, and you just you know give the prayer requests like in the it, during the church service, and uh, <coughs> this woman just decided to pretend that she had a son. And she had no son. And she, you know, the son, I think, you know, went through all these different things, all these prayer requests. I think the son had cancer, got married, had children. I, I remember it had, he, he definitely said the son had cancer. Um, and they prayed their way and he got over cancer and, you know, we're so grateful for the imaginary son. But see, she was delusional and that's something that we all understand. P you know, pe do, people trick themselves into believing things all the time but they always do it because of something else they wanted but when you're deluding yourself into morality overall you're tricking yourself into wanting things when you previously didn't want anything so a person who doesn't want to do anything wants to trick himself into doing things into wanting things so it's, it's just irrational um, that there's no way for it to get off the ground. It, you, it, it's just not, it's not an, you, if you make choices, they're, they're, they have to be within a set of logically possible options. So like some choices are cognitively meaningless, you know, but this part of the talk would be for people who are more prone to really want to come back at you. Um, now, before we talk about the idea that it's an illusion, the interesting thing here is one of the major ways, classically, that people uh, come back against the moral argument for God's existence is they say, does God just make up the moral laws with divine command theory, whatever God wants to make up, or are they higher than God? But you see... If people understand the fundamental nature that morals are desires, then whatever they are, high, whatever the higher thing than God is, would still have desires about what God is supposed to do and not do. So that just that that's just inescapable. 
So if you raise the euthyphro dilemma of, you know, are, are the morals made up by God, like with the roll of a dice, or are they higher than God? That's just a problem that, you know, it doesn't just defeat the thing, you know, because morals are desi desires. And of course, if they understand that, you know, that they haven't really defeated anything, then maybe they'll move forward to actually accepting that, uh, God is the morals. Because that's, that's another false dilemma. You know, are morals higher than God? Or are they beneath God? No, God is the morals. Okay, so the only other, I guess, uh, recourse people can give is, uh, well, there's two other ones you get, um, apart from all the Christian ones. Because the Christians tend to just have a problem with the very idea of apologetics. They don't accept that. And so it's just a good idea just to share with them uh, 1 Peter 3.15 and maybe, you know, something like Romans 1 where it clearly lays it out. Um, but, so here's the thing. You can say that morality is an illusion. All right. And that we, you know, that there is no such thing as morality, it's an illusion. Okay. Now, the issue with this is, uh, most of the time when people bring this up it's essentially what they're saying is you know morality is the product of evolution and so to say that morality is the product of evolution essentially they're they're functioning off like a mechanistic universe and so we are just like biochemical machines and we don't have free will and there is no morality we just function we're just machines that just operate um And the issue with that is, is that if you, if you are such a biochemical machine, then you would, uh, in, 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 so, like, I guess the point is, is like, morality would not come into exist, like, you wouldn't be able to have a, the idea of morality. So if you're just a biochemical machine that like got programmed somehow by some sort of physical process with the concept of morality, uh, the problem is is quite clear. So like a, a simple way a simple way to respond to this before we get to the simple response, uh, you may be asking like, well, what if I'm not a biochemical machine, but someone some other being you know, maybe a supernatural being programmed me with morality, but it was still an illusion. It was still not factual. It was just made up. Well, the problem is, is that's really just subjective morality because how did that other being come up with it to make it up? Um, so that's not really, that's just, a, that's just subjective morality with another, uh, uh, you know, name on it. But a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. Or a turd by any other name would stink just as bad. So, uh, anyway, uh, this idea that you're, you know, a biochemical machine and through the long process of evolution you got programmed with morality, you know, and it's not actually factual. Uh, the fundamental flaw there is like a simple way to explain it is with a classic example from when you were a kid. If your childhood was anything like mine, then adults like to play with you, men and women, and they would overpower you all the time, and you'd be in the laps, you know, playing with adults, you know, and hugging on them and wrestling and, and you know, everything. And especially my uncles like to, but, you know, everyone would do it with me, except my grandparents, I don't think they would ever do it, but, like, you know, everyone would, like, take my hand and make it hit me, you know, just like, because I was just a little baby kid, and like, they would just make me hit myself, and they say, quit hitting yourself, quit hitting yourself, quit hitting yourself, 
everyone's probably experienced the quit hitting yourself game. Um, and you could so like, and you could say like, and they immediately recognize, you know, I'm not doing it. You're you're doing it. No, you're hitting yourself. Your hands hitting your head. You're hitting yourself, and people immediately recognize that. And so then, like, if you say, let's say that, like, you you know, someone else was next to you, and you made them hit that other person, you say, quit hitting them, quit hitting them, quit hitting them. And you would say, as even as a very, very small toddler, you would recognize, I'm not doing it, you're doing it. I'm not doing anything, you're making me do it. I'm not doing anything. And so, if people understand that analogy, then or that, that example, then they understand the, the first key point that you're not evil and you're not good if you're not in control of what you do. You're, in other words, like if, if someone forces you to hurt somebody, you're not evil, they're evil because you had no control. And, if, and, and then if someone forces you to do something good, then like you're not really the good person they are although they're not really good because they force you to do it but like you get the point um and so the goal that we have been programmed with by evolution and programmed is a simplistic way of putting it but essentially a long process of natural selection programmed us with a goal of being good like a machine. So a machine was given a goal. You know, computers are given goals all the time. Do this. Do that. But the problem is machines are never programmed with morality because morality is a goal of not being programmed. Of doing something on your own. And it's logically impossible to program something to not be programmed. Because as soon as it fulfills its programming, it's only doing it because it was programmed to. And if it doesn't fulfill its programming, then it stays programmed. And so it's logically impossible to program a machine with evolution. And anything else is just subjective morality. Either you're making it up, or, or society's making it up, or God in the heavens is making it up. And so both of those are logically impossible. Because, you know, you can't want to do something before you want to do it or, or create the idea of wanting to do things. And then you can't be programmed to not be programmed. And then, you know, morals are desires and there's such a thing as right and wrong. So really like that alone, I think, you know, you could, you could run through it. Just slavery is evil. Talk about how, and both most people are on board right there, and, and and just talk about how it's evil no matter what anyone thinks, you know, and it's just absolutely objectively evil. Then talk about how you know different societies have you know, you know, valued it, show that that's a false dilemma, you know, just because you know ideas on it have changed, you know, just because we know, you know, we know. We, it's you know, just because there are situations in life where our concept of perfection and what's moral, moral perfection has changed, it doesn't mean we know nothing. We can still know something without knowing everything. And then just morals are desires about the way the world should be. Boom, there's a moral lawgiver. Someone says morality is subjective. Well, then that's wanting to create the idea of wanting to do things. You know, you can give an example of a delusion and show how that's someone who was getting something they already wanted. We're talking about people who are creating the idea of wanting to do things. And boom, people immediately recognize, like, okay, yeah, that's ridiculous. And then uh, if someone says that, you know, we were programmed with it and we're just machines and we were programmed through it with, like, a physical biomechanical process, then, you know, I think a great example is the quit hitting yourself example. And people recognize that, like, the desire to be good and not be evil is a desire to do things that you weren't forced to do. And then, so, if evolution programmed you with a goal of being good, then evolution programmed you with a goal of not being programmed, which is logically impossible. Because as soon as you're programmed to not be programmed, if you fulfill that programming, then you're doing what you were programmed to do. But if you don't fulfill that programming, then you are 
you're you're not fulfilling the goal of not being programmed, so you're staying programmed. So it's just that's just airtight. So yeah, and another example I like to give is like a machine, like your GPS in your car, has goals, but it doesn't have morality. It doesn't value the goals. It it doesn't place. It doesn't see one goal as good and another goal as evil. It just functions according to its programming and if you take a wrong turn it just recalculates it, it, it but it doesn't it doesn't care it doesn't have values it doesn't value one goal you know one way or the other and so if you have values then you're not a machine um that's something that's like inescapable but i could see people you know, really, really having a hard time accepting it because it's just so, they haven't heard it before. And people are very accustomed to the idea that, you know, certain people are just very accustomed to the idea that morality is created by evolution because they see logic in it that, like, evolution, if it gets going, would create machines. Basically, animal life and all, all different types of life forms would basically be machines that have goals and they fulfill those goals. The problem is, is they cannot have an idea that those goals are good. And, and I mean, clearly the idea that, that, that the goals are good, they can't have an idea of morality. You know, and clearly the idea of morality exists. I mean, if it doesn't, then I'll just make it up right quick. You know, so you have to say that, like, when I say morality, it's a meaningless concept, um, and that's self-contradictory too, because you're still referring to morality and you're invoking all sorts of, you know, morality, and so you wind up having to deny that there is such a thing as language, like Lichtenstein, to get around this and say that you know words are all meaningless, you know. Um, but that's just self-contradictory, too, because Lichtenstein wrote long books about how language is meaningless. Um, so you, you're starting to catch the point. And the Euthyphro Dilemma, I like how it's, it's delivered a fatal blow by the simple fact that, like, it's got a hole in it, but what doesn't have a hole in it is that morals are desires. So you could sum this up, there's a false dilemma... Just because we don't know everything about morality doesn't mean we can't know, we know nothing about morality, we can know something. Morals are desires about the way the world should be. People create delusions because they want to. Um, but we're, creating morality is creating the very idea of wanting to do things even though you don't, even though you never want to do anything. And then, uh, Good and evil is doing things on your own, not because someone forced you to do it, and you can't be programmed to not be programmed. Uh, and then, slavery is evil. And everyone agrees. So, like, there must be a moral lawgiver. Now, the ramifications of the moral argument for God's existence are so immense because, uh, It means that there's some sort of being who is the foundation of what the right way to live is. And so then, then we get, begin to ask, like, well, is this being evil? Well, it can't, this being can't be evil or can't ever not abide by its moral law because, again, we go back to the Euthyphro dilemma. It must be the morals. It can't just make them up arbitrarily and they can't be above it. It must be the morals. So the being cannot be evil in any way. And so now we have a being of maximal value, of maximal goodness, or anything that's valuable, this being has those properties maxed out. And so then we run, and, then, and this being must exist. So this being has power maxed out. You know, if, if power is valuable or anything that's good, it has it maxed out. Love is maxed out, justice is maxed out, mercy is maxed out, patience is maxed out. Everything that's a virtue is maxed out. So, like, we have a perfect being, a, a, an omnibenevolent being, a loving being. And so, you can, you can make an immediate uh, case and say, alright, we're all evil. Does this being care about our choices? The being does care about our choices. 
Um, so, because it has love maxed out. So how much does it love us? Well, it loves us infinitely. It's maxed out. So, uh, God, might as well call it God, um, God, uh, our choices are meaningful and important to God. So, therefore, the response to our choices must, must be heavy. So, like, in other words, like, if we say, you know, if we do something wrong, then God would respond, you know, with something, you know, with something wrong. So, like, in other words, God would never just say, I'm just going to pretend you didn't do that because I don't really care what you did. Okay. And rather, God, what we would do would always be of maximal importance to God. So, like, the idea of hell and punishment and also... Jesus is suffering on the cross is really a product of love because God loves us and therefore our choices carry great weight and meaning to God. They're important. If Jesus didn't have to suffer and if we didn't go to hell, that would mean that like the things we do are not really that important to God. There's a limit to how important they are. He just decides at some point that he just doesn't really care what we do. But if we go to hell forever, or if God's only son has to die, then there's no limit to how much he cares about our choices. Um, yeah, so like, you see these ramifications flow, and you could say, well, like, well, how strict is God with us? I mean, you know, like, uh, the Muslim's view of God is that, like, you know, God's standards of righteousness are not that high. But again, you could say, well, like, how high would God's standards of righteousness be? They have to be maxed out. God would be like, so like, God would take every single, they would be, you know, if you could imagine, if there's any way they could be higher and stricter, that's where he'd be. So, and then, but also God would want to forgive us because God's loving and generous and, you know, those are virtues. But how forgiving is God? Well, God's forgiveness is maxed out. So the Muslim concept of God is a good, you know, comparison because the Muslim God is willing to forgive to a point, but he also only, his standards of righteousness are, you know, only to a point. It, he doesn't require infinite perfection, but if you go too far, he won't forgive you. And so, the Christian God, you know, requires even one little sin, you're going to hell and you need Jesus for your sins. But, no matter how bad you are, it's the same thing, like, you can be forgiven. So, you know, the Muslim God, you know, if you sink too low, he won't forgive you in it, but like, he doesn't really hold you to a very high standard either. You know, he's not really, you know, he's going to let you slide on a bunch of stuff. Um, so anyway, you can begin to, you can begin to develop some important theological points about this God um, the problem with the moral argument for God's existence is, is I think oftentimes the, other than the ways people slip out of it, is just uh, these theological points. Because uh, the ramifications are immense. Um, sometimes what people come at you with is the classic, you didn't prove everything there is to know about Christianity. You know, I, I, uh, that's what people, you know, they want to know, like, well, can you prove Jesus, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins? And it's like, well, I think we're well on our way to Jesus if we, you know, if you understand the theological ramifications of this. We're well on our way. And, you know, so sometimes you get Christians saying this, I think because, like, they want to, they want to really know, um... But that the, the question of Jesus is just we have to. It's not it's not proven the same way. Um, God would be a fundamental component of reality. Jesus would be more specific, the specific person that you have our internal relationship with, and so it's through the Holy Spirit, and then you can give historical evidence. But anyway, I think that sums up what I was wanting to do with this video. I, I'm just thinking that there's a way to re work the moral argument for God's existence that just makes it a lot harder to deny. 
I'm actually fascinated to think of like, oh, I wonder what kind of escapes people are going to give. I've noticed in different videos where I give different arguments, you hear the same uh, rehashed, trotted out uh, responses. Or, but what I've done with the moral argument in two occasions on two videos, I found that people, if I if I carefully think about like how people respond to it, then what I do is I get people who like can't say the same old same old stuff and oftentimes just say you're dumb except of course for the people who don't actually watch the video and just assume what i said you know those don't count as like anyone i mean like i can't make the video effective enough for those people um but anyway unless i make it like deceptively titled or seductive you know in its in its in its titling which is going to be hard you know, because the concept is provocative, and so to make it seduce somebody away, like, you know, I'd have basically have to just, you know, like I saw, I saw an argument from this YouTube channel called Brain Games or something, Braincraft or something, and he was like, "Can you solve this riddle?" And it was like, and there was some pretty woman on there. And it was like, can you solve this riddle? Pretty lady, right? And then like you click on it and it's just the stupid trolley problem. And, and it's trying to argue that in defense of, uh, 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 utilitarian morals, which are like abhorrent. The ramifications of utilitarian morals are abhorrent. And they just didn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. And they acted like they were touching it with a 10 foot pole, but like they weren't. Like the Nazi ideology is completely supported by utilitarian ethics. And then, like, they tried to answer all the questions they raised with neuroscience and trying to understand the human brain. And it's like, well, that avoids the whole thing. Like, if it's just a matter of how our brains happen to function, we could just, you know, well, what if some creatures from another planet had different brains and, like, and their morality from their brains was different, well then, like, who are we to say that they're wrong? Of course, like, your whole basis for everything is just how the brain functions. You know, and then, like, what if we restructure our brains and work a different way? Like, oh, it's just terrible. It was just terrible. I like, like, couldn't believe that someone actually put this much money and time into making this video, and it was just utter nonsense. But anyway, there you have it. Bye-bye.